joining us. We are going to just briefly start with a few remarks before we get into the meat and potatoes of today, but it's nice to see um, friends from the region and friends beyond. So um, I just want to start by introducing myself. I'm SN Vialba, the Community Planning Director for the Naugatuck Valley Council of Governments, and briefly just reiterate who we are and what we do. So for those of you in our region, you're very familiar with me and, and our team and the way that, that we reach out and say hello and check in. And so um, for those who are not, um, you have a council of governments. There are eight of us, nine of us in the, the state. We serve um, all of our municipalities. And here at NVCOG, our community planning division is really committed to helping and supporting our municipalities through their, our, their land use staff. And so one thing that we had heard was um, issues with aquifer protection area compliance. And so um, we are so thankful that we have been able to partner with the state. And I want to especially thank Kim Zapla for um, all of her help with this. Kim, as many of you know, um, helped participate in our commissioner training with DEEP, with Diane Ikovic and Darcy Winters, and, and talking with Kim about um, aquifer protection, we said, you know, it would be great if we could do some sort of series. And it was just a dream until Molly Johnson, who will introduce herself, and Melissa Mostoy and Melissa I'm going to butcher your last name. I'm so sorry, but I want you all to introduce yourselves as well. Um, Melissa F. joined the team, and it's just been so wonderful to see um, an idea come to reality. And, and I know that DEEP has done a significant amount of work in assisting with this effort. And I want to commend Molly Johnson, our community planner, for all of her time, her commitment, um, her dedication to this. So with that, welcome, welcome, planners in our region, if you need anything. This is just a reminder that we're here. We want to help um, planners outside of our region. Um, reach out to your COGS. I know that they feel similarly. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Molly, and, and I hope that everybody enjoys the, the first of many. So thank you. Thank you, SN. Um, yes, as you said, my name is Molly Johnson. I am a community planner here at Nogtuck Valley Council of Governments. I'm very excited to put on this series in partnership with DEEP. So I wanted to talk through some of the logistics today before we dive into the content. Um, just so you know, uh, this series is really meant to be um, a practical pathway to working towards compliance. So we really encourage you every session to bring your implementation questions that you have. Um, each session is going to be about half um, program content, and then the other half is going to be um, really time, we call them office hours, but time to work with deep, ask your questions, and even just set aside time in your day to um, work on some pro some pieces of the APA uh, program that you've been needing, meaning to get to. Um, and we will be recording every session for people who can't make it, um, but just know that we won't, we don't plan to post the Q&A portion because we really want you to be able to be um, open to whatever you, whatever question you have and not hesitate at all to ask. So um, we will cut that part off before we post online. And then um, I'll just talk about what's coming up for the series. So today is going to be a program overview. Um, we realize it might be be a little overwhelming because we're going to talk through each piece of the program. So just um, stick with us. We're going to um, try to really start you off setting you up with how what way we're going to move through the rest of the series. And then in February, we're going to have an amazing APA champion, Alexis from Norwalk, who who has been a leader in aquifer protection um, to talk about her best practices of the program she's running. In March, we will be talking more on the communication side and um, talking about best practices for your website um, and things you should include on there. Um, for the for April session, we have the um, we'll talk about registration, um, and I think that um, knowing that. A lot of towns in our region are working on that element. I think that'll be a very beneficial um, session to attend. 
And then May and June, we'll be doing site visits in the lower and upper valley. Um, with that, we wanted to um, be asking, so, so consider volunteering if you'd like to have your town um, highlighted during those site visits. We're looking for two volunteers for uh, those sessions to host the group um, to go visit a um, potential registration site. And then in July, we'll be talking about what it takes to maintain compliance. Um, so that's just the general overview. And one thing to note is that alongside the program, we've developed some materials and also we'll be sharing some deep materials that we have. Um, so today and um, or yesterday, I sent you a, uh, a checklist compliance sheet um, I recommend if you can print it out and um, follow along. It really breaks down the different elements of uh, APA compliance and is a good way of monitoring your progress. Um, and then following this session um, in the coming week, I'll be sending out a zip file folder with more resources for you um, to follow along throughout the series that uh, you can refer to, it'll have examples of, like, for example, example letters um, to potential registrants, um, how people have done enforcement. So it, it'll have some good references that you can use. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to say that um, we really encourage this to be as interactive as possible. So feel free to interrupt and um, ask your questions. Um, you can do so by raising your hand so that we will know and, and then we'll call on you to unmute yourself. So um, with that, I will stop sharing. I'll pass it over to Kim to get us started with the program overview. And also, yes, uh, uh, Melissa um, F and Melissa M, feel free to also introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kim Zeppla. I'm with Connecticut DEEP. I've been with the Aquifer Protection Area Program for 20 years next month. Um, so I have a lot of experience. And with me today um, are two new staff members of DEEP, Melissa Mostaway and Melissa Fonstock. And I'll just let them quickly talk about um, what they're going to be doing for the program series and what they do for the aquifer protection program and then we'll jump into the presentation itself hi everyone my name is melissa fonstock um, i'm an environmental analyst at deep uh, kim is my supervisor um, so i've been learning everything I can from her about the aquifer protection program. Um, I've been working with some municipalities um, to check like their compliance and everything. Um, I did just start in August, so still have lots to learn and learning all that I can from Kim. And um, I will be doing the registration 101 um, presentation in April. So I look forward to that. Hi. So we're all in the same office together, so everybody's hearing this right now. <laughs> but um, I'm Melissa Mostaway. I've been at DEEP for about a year and a half, and I've been, just like Melissa was saying, we've been learning with um, Kim about the Aquifer Protection Area Program. I mostly work with the state registration, so this year I actually helped renew 15 uh, licenses registered with the state, so I've been kind of hitting the ground running. I've also been helping with the municipal contacts, getting to know everybody. And um, I'm coming to learn that I actually have met some of um, you all on this meeting in my previous role with the Southwest Conservation District. So it's nice to see you in my old role and now under a new hat. Thanks, Melissa. And I just want to say thank you so much to Molly and SN and the Naugatuck Valley COG for hosting us today and for this program series. Um, this is really exciting and we are very happy to be in this partnership. So with that, I'm going to get going um, and I'm going to share my screen and we will start the program.
Can everyone see the slideshow? Yes, awesome. Okay, so today um, we're going to talk about Connecticut's Aquifer Protection Area Program. And let's see, how do I advance my slides? I apologize for the technical difficulties. Let's see here. Okay, can everyone see the outline of the presentation? <laughs> okay, I've figured out my first task of the day, how to forward slides. Um, so today's presentation will include aquifer, aquifer basics, the overview of the Aquifer Protection Area Program, municipal responsibilities and next steps, some training opportunities, and our contact information. So what is an aquifer? An aquifer is any geologic formation in rock or sediment that can yield a usable amount of water. It's found in bedrock, and it can be very high yielding um, if the spaces in the cracks are large and low yielding, if the cracks are intercon few interconnections in the cracks. There's stratified drift aquifers, which are very high yielding. This is sand and gravel aquifers. And if it's low yielding, then it's a silt or clay. Aquifers are also found in glacial till, but these are very typically low yielding because um, of the poorly connected spaces in the soils. In Connecticut, we have all three types, stratified drift, till, and bedrock aquifers. Um, the stratified drift are usually found in the river valleys, and these are our highest yielding aquifers. This is where most of our drinking water comes from. In, they're found in till and also in bedrock. Connecticut aquifers are important. They're, they're also um, our significant source of existing public drinking water and a primary source of future public drinking water. About two thirds of Connecticut residents rely on drinking water from wells that are fed by aquifers. These aquifers are very vulnerable. They're shallow, unconfined, and highly porous. They're subject to pollution threats from the land use activities that occur above them. Aquifer pollution threats include operations from in industry. They use solvents and other chemicals, and if they're not handled properly, they can pose a threat to the aquifer. Gas stations, fueling and petroleum is, um, is can provide um, pollution threats from underground storage tanks and fueling and fuel spills at gas stations. Vehicle service stations and underground storage tanks. You can think about what kind of pollution threats you have in your town, in your aquifer. Handling of storage of storage of bulk chemicals. Typically on the shoreline, we see the bulk storage chemicals in the close to the harbors. So the, the Aquifer Protection Area Program is a program for the protection of large public drinking water supply wells. The program's purpose is to identify major existing public water supply aquifers and protect them from pollution by managing land use activities occurring nearby. The Aquifer Protection Area Program regulates activities that are conducted at businesses. Examples of businesses include gas stations, where fueling operations occur, service stations, where re repair and maintenance of vehicles occur, metal manufacturing, town garages, landfills, junkyards. These are types of businesses that this program regulates. So what is an aquifer protection area? 
It's the critical portion of the aquifer that provides water to the well. It's the area of contribution and recharge to the well. Aquifers are protected under the program must meet the following criteria. They must be in stratified drift, and it must be an existing well used as a public water supply system that serves a population of a thousand or more. So not every town has aquifer protection areas, but they may, um, they may protect these areas um, under this program. So in the state of Connecticut, we have about, this is a map of the state of Connecticut showing the aquifer protection areas. Those shown in red um, have adopted regulations, adopted the map and are implementing the program. There are a few areas that have not yet uh, been designated as aquifer protection areas. In Bristol, there is one in particular that is still um, has not been mapped by the uh, water company and also in Westbrook. But there's about 127 aquifer protection areas in Connecticut. It makes up about two to three percent of the state's land area. Um, where we've estimated about 1,800 potentially regulated facilities. And most of these are in municipalities um, along the river valleys and about 500 state facilities um, will be regulated. In the Naugatuck Valley COG, these are towns with aquifer protection areas shown in red and in blue in Bristol. Let's go into the municipal responsibilities. Each town in the program is, has a responsibility to designate an aquifer protection agency by a local ordinance. And it's usually an, an existing commission that is appointed and DEEP has a model ordinance um, that can help to uh, use as a model to uh, designate the Aquifer Protection Agency. Um, and that's under Connecticut General Statute Section 22A-3540. And it also states that at least one member of the agency or staff of the agency must complete the course in technical training from DEEP, which is required also by Connecticut General Section, Section 22A-3540C. The agency is responsible for the local administration of the program and also local enforcement. Their duties include delegating the aquifer protection area boundary and placing that on the zoning map, adopting municipal aquifer, aquifer protection area regulations, completing a land use inventory, registering and permitting regulated facilities, and enforcing the program and ensuring compliance. Here's an example of um, the delineation of the level A aquifer protection area on the zoning map of the city of Bristol. The, um, you can see at the bottom of the screen, there's a blue shaded area. It's identified as the level A aquifer protection area and the zoning overlay um, legend includes the name Upper and Lower Whites Bridge and Mixed Bridge, Mixed Street, um, with the effective date of 5-27-11. Delineating the aquifer protection area map is the first responsibility of the municipality. So it must be on a local zoning map showing an effective date. And the regulations require that um, the municipality place this aquifer protection area on the zoning map within 120 days after being notified by DEEP. The process includes just placing the boundary on the municipal zoning map, publishing the notice of the delineation in the newspaper, including the map and or description of the area and contact information. To verify, verify the delineation, we ask that you send a copy to DEEP with the effective date 
and we will send you a letter um, for your files stating that you've met this uh, regulatory and statutory requirement. And then you make the map available in the office of the town clerk or agency and online. No public hearing is required. The regulations and statutes are very clear that this is um, a map that cannot be contested and that it um, is simply placed on the zoning map. The next action of the Municipal Aquifer Protection Agency is to adopt local aquifer protection area regulations. These regulations should be consistent with state regulations and DEEP has prepared a model regulation that was updated in 2010. The local regulations may be more stringent and may include more best management practices. The regulations require DEEP approval and effective date. Um, the process includes drafting the proposed aquifer protection area regulations, setting a fee schedule, and this can be done in several different ways. You can place a fee schedule right in the regulations themselves, or you may refer to a local ordinance where the regulation, the fees are set in an ordinance. Uh, the benefit of referring to an ordinance of a fee schedule outside of the regulations allows um, the regulations to be more flexible. DEEP does not need to approve the fees set in a local ordinance, but DEEP does need to approve the fees um, in the aquifer protection area regulations. So every time these regulations are modified or updated, DEEP is required to approve them. So setting the, the local ordinance of fees separate um, is allows the town and the municipality to update fees uh, anytime they update their ordinance outside of the regulatory framework of sending it to the state for approval. So once you draft your regulations, you schedule a public hearing, you send uh, the proposed regulations as required by the statutes to DEEP, the affected water company or water companies, in some situations there's more than one water company, um, and the town clerk, along with a notice of the public hearing. You conduct the public hearing, considering public comment, and then you vote on the regulation. You submit the final regulation to DEEP for approval, and once DEEP approves, you establish an effective date and make it available. This is uh, the front page of our model regulations that were updated in 2010. There's three key changes, and these all regard brownfields, and it allows additional time for businesses that are located in brownfields and subject to the brownfields regulations, it allows them more time to comply. So it allows them a 10 year window to comply. This model regulation is available on our website and we can also work with you directly to help you update um, or adopt your model regulation, the regula local regulations. The third municipal responsibility is to inventory land uses within the aquifer protection area. This process includes reviewing zoning maps and buildings to determine regulated facilities and regulated activities occurring within the aquifer protection area. You may need to conduct a drive-by to verify uh, what the businesses are doing. And then you can create a tracking sheet and it's important to keep the tracking sheet up to date and available for, for DEEP, DPH, the water company, um, to keep us informed of what is being regulated um, or what's potentially regulated in the aquifer protection area. DEEP, actually DEP in 2000 did an initial inventory of land uses in the aquifer protection area. It is now over 20 years old, but we do have that and can provide that to you um, as a starting point if you um, need to look back uh, 
and find out certain land use areas that um, may have been grandfathered in. So if you do need that inventory, we can provide that to you. And then uh, registering regulated activities is the most important and critical part. Once facilities are determined that they are conducting regulated activities, or once the, the town determines, um, you notify businesses the need to register, you provide a form, a registration form and contact information. Um, most municipalities, this is um, a one-on-one -on -one helping the businesses get through the process, complete the forms, submit the forms. Um, and you can do that also by conducting site inspections and site visits to um, help the business owners understand that they are required to be um, complete these forms and why it's important for them to register. And um, to do so is to grandfather the business in so that they can continue operating. And then additionally, you will conduct site inspections to ensure compliance with best management practices and then issue aquifer protection area registrations. These are good for five years. They may be renewed, modified, or transferred. And keeping track of the status is really important, especially transferred properties and transferred registrations. Um, they're limited to the regulated activities conducted inside the APA boundary. Um, so if a parcel is divided, you're going to, by um, aquifer protection area boundary, you're going to register only those facilities that are actively conducting regulated activities inside. They may be conducting regulated activities outside the boundary, but um, those are not regulated. So they're outside, if they're, the way it was explained to me by Rob Huss, the grandfather of this program, the line's drawn in the sand, in the sand and gravel. If you're in, you're in. If you're out, you're out. So if you're in, you're regulated. If you're out, you're not regulated. And sometimes that boundary divides a parcel and it may be complicated or confusing, but we can certainly help you with making those determinations. Once you've registered your facilities, send copies to DEEP, DBH, and the affected water company. Tracking facilities and compliance is really important and report to DEEP annually the list of registered facilities. We take this information, we put it in a report, and we provide it to, this, to the legislature and our um, um, the, the um, committees of cognizance, the environment committee and, and other committees of cognizance. And then when needed, you can conduct progressive enforcement. So what is regulated? Generally existing activities that involve the use, storage, handling, or disposal of, of hazardous materials or other potential contaminants of the aquifer will be subject to the aquifer protection area regulations. These are called regulated activities. Here's some examples of the regulated activities. Auto repair and maintenance shops, uh, fuel dispensing, underground storage tanks, metal production or fabrication, metal plating, uh, vehicle salvaging, junkyards, uh, decreasing of parts or equipment, dry cleaning solvents, uh, pesticides, chemical storage, finishing and stripping of furniture and production or refining of chemicals, asphalt plants. Are there exceptions? Yes. Um, certain activities are allowed if they're connected to a public sewer, for example, a car wash. Certain as of right activities um, are not regulated. Residential and agricultural are not regulated. And then conditional exceptions, including volume thresholds. Lower, smaller volumes um, are not regulated if they meet certain conditions. So is there a list of all regulated activities? Yes, the 28 regulated activities are listed in the aquifer protection area regulations and they're also found in the appendix of one of um, our Connecticut aquifer protection area program municipal manual. So what are the next steps for implementing the aquifer protection area program? Deep 
suggest and recommend, strongly recommends that you hold regular meetings of the Aquifer Protection Agency. Um, and that may be once a month, it may be once quarterly, it might be a few times a year, but at the very minimum, the Aquifer Protection Agency should meet once a year. Uh, but, and then create a new Aquifer Protection Agency webpage. And you'll be hearing more about this at um, the content for an APA webpage presentation that Melissa Mostaway from our office will be presenting as part of this series on March 20th. The next step is to amend your aquifer protection, your municipal aquifer protection area regulations to be consistent with the state 2010 model. Next would be to compile a list of businesses, an inventory of all potential registrants. You can use the tax assessors list, check the Yukon's website for Connecticut CTE Co, check fire marshals list. You can look at businesses uh, with hazardous materials and then send a letter, call or email owners to inform them that they need of their need to register. You can conduct site inspections to ensure compliance with best management practices and then register businesses that are conducting these activities by issuing a cover letter, letter and a certificate and be sure to send copies as required to DEEP, DBH and the water utility. Um, there will be an Aquifer Protection Area Registration 101 presentation by Melissa Fonstock of our office on April 17th as part of this program series. These are, there's, um, we offer a new training opportunity. If you haven't taken it, uh, we've developed a new online uh, course. This is free. It was custom built for municipal aquifer protection agencies, and it meets the re training requirements of the Aquifer Protection Act. The course assists municipal agencies with their requirements. Um, of their regulatory requirements and responsibilities of the program. And it instructs agency members and staff uh, with knowing the law and assists them with steps to take to register facilities. The format is online, it's at your own pace. It's 13 modules with text videos, interactive activities and practices and quizzes. And it was just recently reopened on UConn's platform. And I encourage you all to take the course if you haven't done so, or maybe take it as a refresher if you haven't taken uh, one of our online programs and only participated in a um, in-person program as in the past. We also have available the Connecticut's Aquifer Protection Area Program Municipal Manual. This is available online and it's a comprehensive technical guidebook with reference materials and examples and model documents um, to help you at the local level um, implement this very important program. Here's our Aquifer Protection Area website address and our email address. Um, I encourage you to check out the website and its resources. And if anything's missing, please let us know. We're happy to update and um, add more content. And also feel free to reach out to us at this email address, deep.aquiferprotection at ct.gov. Um, anytime you have questions or you're um, wondering about a next step, um, we're here to help you. We're here to assist you with this program implementation. And um, by emailing us, we are very responsive. We check the box often. Here's my contact information. Um, it'll be part of the slideshow that will be presented um, and shared with all of you. So I just wanna leave you with this. We all depend on clean, safe drinking water. The benefits of protection avoid cost of contamination, reduce the risk to human health. There are environmental benefits. There's economic benefits. It increases public confidence. 
and there are quality of life benefits. So I ask you to join me in this very important program and let's all work towards safe, clean drinking water. And there's our moment of zen. <laughs> and with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Kim, for your presentation. Um, so now we'll move into the office hours portion. So I'm gonna just share a slide. Um, so today we have a couple of recommendations um, if you're gonna be participating in the full series. Um, so there, we recognize that there's a few people who've joined from outside the NVCOG region. Um, all of the NVCOG municipalities should have received an update with their compliance status from DEEP. Um, that email came from me uh, within the last 24 hours. <laughs> so um, you should have that, but if you are from outside the region, um, Today, we recommend you reach out to DEEP so you can understand more details about your APA status. Um, and then for everyone, um, if you have not already adopted the 2010 model regulations, we recommend that that be something to get started to look at today. Um, and also you can get started on an inventory if your municipality has not already done that. Um, so the way that office hours are going to work is that we, um, all four of us will be staying until 10 a.m. Um, and so it can be quiet um, if you wanted to get started working and see if you have questions come up along the way. Um, or if you have immediate questions, feel free to raise your hand and unmute yourself um, and ask them. But we'll just be here in the background um, giving you the space to um, get questions answered as necessary. Um, but uh, in case you have to go, I just want to say thank you for coming to the first session today. Um, I hope you find this whole series beneficial. Please re reach out to me with feedback, um, and then we'll be in contact um, for next month's session. So thank you. Molly, would you like to stop recording? Great point, we can do that. <laughs>